Hello everybody and welcome to another Saturday in our BNS Women's Month celebration. If you don't know, every for the month of March, Bella Niger Style has been celebrating women all through in the beauty, fashion and lifestyle industry. And every Saturday we host BNS Convos, which is an interactive conversation with female leaders in different industries this is our third session and i'm super super excited for this you can follow our conversations with the hashtag bns convos and hashtag bns women's month on instagram and twitter and you see everything we've been doing you can also check out bellanijastyle.com for more information so yes today today is another interesting day and i'm so 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 excited by the the speakers that we have lined up for today without for without much ado without further ado let me introduce myself my name is mary eduro i am the head of content bella ninja style and i will be convening today's discussion with me in this room is lisa who is the founder and creative director of lisa falawio studios andrew by lisa we also have smaya who is the founder and creative director of Pistis Ghana. We have Didi, who is the founder and creative director of London-based women's wear brand April by Alex. We also have Tenny, who is the founder of Clan, and Ejiro, who is the founder of Ejiro Amos Tafiri. So as you can see, we have an interesting cross-section of designers from the continent and from out of the continent but all african designers and you know i can just feel like the energy from this room is amazing because these women have mastered the art of their crafts and also mastered how to turn their passion into profits they ventured into an industry years ago and although now the industry is very saturated they've been able to keep their brand going and i would say successful over the past years so i'm excited to learn from them and i hope and i know for a fact that this conversation is definitely going to be very insightful i encourage everybody to participate ask questions if you want to and i'm sure the speakers will be happy to answer them okay let's get right into it the designers will introduce themselves and we'll take it from there Um, just a reminder to everybody, to all the speakers, this um, conversation is being recorded so we can repurpose for our YouTube platforms and all our other Bella Niger style platforms. Um, hi, Lisa. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Thank you guys for having me on this platform. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And hi to everyone who's tuned in. Is that the right word? Tune into Clubhouse? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, I, I started the brand, uh, well, we started out as Jewel by Lisa, which is still um, the mother brand name, should I say. Um, but of course, a lot of people know us as well as Lisa Falawio, which is one of the labels within the brand Jewel by Lisa. I started out in 2004. Um, I think for me, it was just, you know, um, filling a gap that I felt was missing in our fashion eco ecosystem in Nigeria, which is what I thought, you know, it was, um, I just didn't think that there was anything that appealed to me in terms of fashion. Um, and I just thought, well, you know what, I, I mean, this is me being a lawyer. I got my two degrees as a lawyer, practiced for a year. And of course, at that, at that point in time, I felt that, um, the legal practice wasn't for me. Um, just like the, the ladies who'd spoken before me, um, fashion has always been something that I've had some sort of love affair with. Um, but it's not as organic, should I say, as the first speaker who's a mom, who grew up with her mom, you know, being um, a designer or having her own brand or label. Um, for me, it was just a love uh, of dressing up and just loving everything fashion. Um, however, I still pursued law as my career at that point in time. Anyhow, um, I'm not being fully satisfied with law 
um, I decided to face what I felt was most natural to me, I think, what I had a passion for, and that was indeed fashion. And so for me, it was just filling a gap. I felt that, you know, um, there wasn't anything in Nigeria um, with what was available to me in Nigeria to um, make or to, I, I didn't think fashion was um, what I wanted it to be. So I wanted to be able to buy things here. I wanted to be able to wear things that were made here, but things that I thought were modern, things that were fresh, things that were quite cool, you know? And so I decided that I was going to take it up and, and, and that was it. That was, it was just my decision. And so I started to um, work with uh, the familiar Ankara fabric. And, you know, for me, it was also about innovation. It was about doing something fresh and brand new, which I think is, um, but if you're going to do anything, you know, you should do something that people may not have seen or a new way of interpreting what people are familiar with. And so I decided to um, work with the Ankara fabric, which, um, we've known for said decades i would say um and even centuries actually um and so yeah and that was it really i i um went out i will never forget you know after making the decision and sort of having a business plan and knowing what you know what the, my goals were in starting this brand um yeah i went out on my own and bought some fabric and you know i used to sketch um because I, I also have a flair for art you know um so i used to sketch and i sort of had ideas of what exactly i wanted to see in terms of design and yeah, and that was it and um, i'm not formally trained obviously and so i had to um have that find the help of um seamstresses tailors you know, to help um, execute my ideas. And that was really how the brand started. And so we got to work, started making pieces. Um, and then, of course, like I said earlier, it was about, you know, making something fresh, you know, rejuvenating what was old, you know. And so using the Ankara fabric, which was familiar, um, and making these modern designs, um, and then we decided to bring in the artisanal work and that was the beading, you know, on this fabric, which is something I hadn't seen. And I've always been a girl who likes all of that, you know, the extras. Um, and so, yeah, and so we decided to start doing this hand embellishment on Ankara. So you have this really modern, fresh design, very clean, um, but still with detail. And then you have this amazing craftsmanship, you know, um, sort of an intersection of that, you know, so it's using local fabrics and still with an edge and, you know, that modernity. And then also the intersecting that with artisanal work, you know, and I think for me, that was the, the whole idea. And I think that was just, that was fresh. It was brand new. It was something that I hadn't seen done. And I think it was exciting. I think, people saw that people were excited and lo and behold the brand um is here today and we've we've been pushing that and um of course we've evolved and uh, yeah and you know we also are you know strong on our prints you know and it's lots of color and um our design of integrity which is you know something that you know the the brand is is strong on and um yeah so Joe by Lisa, Lisa Falario, that's kind of me or us in a nutshell. Thanks so much, Lisa. And amazing, amazing work. Um, okay, so first of all, I'll say Samaya Pistis is one brand that does so many great things with Ankara fabric and also in the bridal space, but also still balancing occasion wear and bridal wear. It's really, really amazing the work you're doing on the continent. And for Lisa Folawio, I don't know if Lisa knows me personally, but I stalk her on social media. I'm always commenting and super <laughs> obsessed oh with Lisa Folawio. 
So Lisa mm-hmm. Falawio was the first brand I ever did write a an op-ed about, so to speak. This is like really? five, six years ago. Yeah, like the first time I ever wow. dissected like a run a, a collection with my with my writing, oh. obviously. So it's it's an intense okay. it's an intense relationship. <laughs> but oh yeah, God. really, really amazing work over the years. I continue to be awed by your designs and it's really, really great to so be on much. this conversation with you. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Hi, Ejiro. <laughs> okay. Hi, Ejiro. Hi, Mary. Hi. Lovely Hi, to have everyone. you here this evening. Good evening. Lovely to be here, speaking with everyone, and to be with so many fashion greats on the continent. It's very nice to be here this evening. You're welcome. So basically, we're just speaking about um, how uh, the, each of you started in fashion and just that come up story. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I've told my story like countless <laughs> times. I can imagine. <laughs> but, but it never gets old. Yeah. So I'll just, uh, just bear with me. No problem. Um, I, 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 I got into fashion pretty early. And not because that was always what I was going to do. So growing up, I was a regular geek, science head. Um, so everyone in my family, an extended family, called me a doctor right from primary school. So I was that kid that went on all the school um, competitions and all of that. So everyone just thought you do something in engineering, medicine, or something. And that was the path. Like I was towing. And in QC, I got SS1 and teenage life happened and I started to rebel. And I was looking for excitement. And that led me from my Greek class, which was my traditional subject in, subject in Queen's College, and that led me to clothing and textile. And when I got there, they were like, this is science student, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm seeking excitement. I just want to study my life and you know something. I'm tired of reading by myself and being asked to go and summarize my notes from the textbook. So uh, the teacher said, I'll give you a few weeks, and if you are not uh, our material, then you'll go back. So the very first day in that class, we went on an excursion to Yaba Tech at School of Arts and Main Stop Fashion Studio, and my life changed. So that was my baptism story, my baptism moment. So I, I totally just found fashion. I, I have that picture of me in my school uniform. Of, as in I was entranced by this world in the HOD department on, on the board till today. So every time I go to that school, I'm able to see the 14 year old me completely lost in a in, in new world. And that was the day I discovered fashion as it is I mean, as a profession, as a career. Because up until then, I was just going to do something science, engineering, or medicine. But I knew that it was not what I really wanted, but I couldn't express myself. And I didn't really understand why I didn't want it. I just felt I couldn't leave my own personal mark. I knew I would be good at it. I mean, I would do my work, but I would just be existing. But I wanted to do more than exist. I wanted to leave my mark on the stands of time. And then when I found fashion, it was a combination of all my loves. Mathematics, arts drawing, science. So with pattern drafting, you get to do technical drawing, a lot of mathematics. That was awesome for me. I mean, I didn't have to train with math because I lost so much. And I got to create my own things. And there was an age who created this. And even if I'm not on the earth again, there will be things that I have created that would leave as my creation. And, um, you know, that, that was what guided that sort. And then I left there that day knowing that my, my career path had changed. But now, at the time, there was nothing like a fashion. It wasn't really known as a career in Nigeria. I mean, we had tailors. We had some designers. We had designers like um, Diola Sibu, but she wasn't Diola Sibu then. And what was it called? Then what was your mom's brand called then? Odua. Odua. Uh, Odua. Uh, so many others. And I, I just started reading about them and discovering them in newspapers and I'm like okay so this is what it is as a career and then I'll watch TV and see someone like Miriam Babangida who always wore those clothes and then there was this presenter on NT who would always write her designer's name so that was my introduction to fashion before that I was I'm, I am a tomboy so and I 
pretty much not want to go looking for clothes except on Sunday. I, I give my t-shirts and my shorts. But going to church and I want to dress up and that determines my mood. So then I found this thing that I loved and I poured myself completely into it. And I started getting all the prices for for clothing and textile. And I would spend time making gifts for everyone in class for their birthday um, for my clothing and textile class assignments, you know, making them stuff. So I did write jam to get into medical school, but I made sure I didn't pass because I knew if I passed and I got admission, there was no way I was going to go to an art school. Wow. I, I, begged, I begged my dad that I wanted to do the jam that I told him right after the exam and I did not, I was not going to pass. And he's like, you've never failed any exam in your life. Why would you say that? That first of all, we got there late. Then everything was just confusing. So I didn't even finish writing. So I know I won't pass. And I don't want this year to waste. Can I just buy a polyjam for I was like, are you sure? I said, yes. So he bought the polyjam for me. I said, fill it and submit it, hoping I will fill science lab tech, like a normal science student. No, Adriel kept this form till the last day. And I went to my dad while he was trying to rush to work. Early in the morning, like 5 a.m. And I said, Dad, what is it? What is it? Go. Um, I have something to tell you. I had prayed overnight. I had not slept. <laughs> I knew that. I was trying to break the man's heart. And I told him that there's this course. You know, I do good and text. I know what's that? One of the courses that I, I offer at school. And then there's this course in, in higher institution. I mean, not university, but polytechnic. And it's called uh, Clothing Technology and Fashion Design. It's the one course. And so, that's what I want to feel. My dad went pale. You don't want to be a doctor, you want to be a designer. What are you saying? That's what I want to do, sir. He said, I can't deal with this now. Fill that form and submit it. I know you could be right. You are my daughter. I just went and I prayed and I filled fashion and I submitted it. So this thing comes out. My dad's friend is the HOD of art department and he comes rejoicing to my dad. Hey, hey, much. Your daughter got into our school. She's at DJ. Which your school the daughter gets into? She's a scientist. Like, no, she filled for art. She got into the art school. My dad was livid. Either way, my mom begged him, oh, you know, she's rebelling, she's a teenager, and let her just go. And that was my one chance, and I wasn't going to lose it. So I just grabbed onto it. I still kept writing German. I kept passing, but I never told them. I kept telling them I was faithful. And that's how I went through five years of art school. Did internship, first one at um, Zizikado, second one at Tiffany Amba. Um, after that, I went back to school, finished HND, and then I worked out of Africa doing my NYC. And after that, I went back to Tiffany Amas for two years. Then I decided it was time for me to take plunge. And, you know, so I wasn't really planning on becoming an entrepreneur even while I was being a student. I knew it would take me like 10, 15 years. That was my dream. Like, I would eventually go abroad, work for Valentino. This was what was all in my head, you know, get a job with Valentino or Calvin Klein or Alexander McQueen. Um, and then work for like 10, 15 years and come back to Nigeria and set up the company. But then I was stuck in Nigeria and then I worked with all these great people and I saw through the shows that we went on on the continent, outside the continent. I saw that I could really do this as a business. I saw the, the gap in the market for affordable, um, aspirational fashion, luxury fashion. And I also saw the gap for of ready to wear. I mean, Tiffany Amber was doing ready to wear, but it was high in luxury and it appealed to socialize. But I also knew there were up, upcomers in the um, social crime and they needed to be catered to. And so I decided to write a business plan around that for occasions where and start my own fashion brand. And then Adrian Mustafi was born 11 years ago in March. Wow. Wow. Thanks so much, Adrian. I'm super inspired by your journey from secondary school and all the interesting things you did just to stick to your passion. I wish I had the guts when I was younger though. But yeah, kudos so far. Really, really inspiring story. Hi, Tenny. Hi, Mary. Hi. How are you? I'm doing good. Lovely to have you here. I'm so happy to be here. Thank <laughs> you for this platform. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so we'd love to know how you started in fashion. Uh, wow. Okay, there's a long story, but I'm just going to keep it sh- as short as possible. <laughs> um, <laughs> my mom um, is just a girl, so when she, I mean, from when I was tiny, from when I was little, before I could even probably speak, 
I that was literally all my mom was doing. Like it was always about some dress or um, you know, some kind of I, I mean I knew about Ashoki from like the age of six, seven. Um and I essentially would she wouldn't have like a choice but to take myself and my sisters, my two sisters with her on like trips because she was doing a lot of shows in Rome and in um, South Africa. Like she did Mnet and um, Alta Moda, I think, in Rome and also New York. So we would go with her. Um, it would typically be myself, my two sisters, her and my grandma who's late now. Um, and so this is a, a story of three generations. Um, of, the, of fashion being passed down from my grandmother to my mom and then to us. So we would all travel together and everyone would have their own say backstage in terms of, you know, what colors look nice, uh, what model should wear what, and just comments on how the show went. So even six or seven year old me and my sisters would have a comment on, on you know, how the show went and who was wearing what. Um, I remember dressing models from as young as 10. Um, and even though, you know, that was all exciting and fascinating, uh, there was, it was always met by some sort of, um, I, let me call it, it's, it, my dad was really skeptical, essentially, about us being uh, too exposed to fashion. I think he thought that it was some sort of fantasy for a woman. And so that was the first bias that, you know, we came up against. And we started to wonder if it was actually something that was capable of generating uh, substantial, significant revenue. And I think it was so, um, let me say, what was outstanding was my most determination, even in the face of that. Like, she just was just like, you know, like, this is my life. This is what I love. I'm just going to keep doing this. So a lot of the time after school, instead of going home to watch TV, it would always be like, okay, you guys come to the office. I'm like, no, we want to watch, you know, TV shows or, you know, cartoons. And she's like, nope, you're going to come, you're going to work. You're going to, she was doing a lot of beating back then on our showcase. So we would go and help um, out in the workshop. So that was our first sort of um, encounter with fashion. Uh, we found it very exciting, but also very, the way she did fashion was a lot of detail, it was painstaking, and we were just like, oh, this is so, so, so long, like, it's a lot of work. But anyway, we all went to secondary school, and then we all did, uh, went to uni. I studied law, um, and I did not enjoy it. My dad was so, so keen on me going to law school. I know it's probably a waste, but I didn't go to law school. Um, and my reasoning was, I just didn't see how that would, me studying law or practicing law would impact the lives of, of many people. Um, I had worked in three different law firms and one particular experience I had, uh, I witnessed someone being treated really unfairly, she was a woman, and it just really upset me. And I just thought that this could not be me. I, I feel like one thing I've always known is that whatever I was going to do was going to be, there would be a social responsibility attached. Um, so at that point in time, even though my dad was very much about Tenny, just do law, like, I promise you, you won't regret it. I was just like, mm, nah, I don't think so. Because I spoke to a couple of lawyers as well, and they just seemed, they seemed so miserable. Like, they were all like, oh, yeah, like, we work, like, long hours, and, you know, there isn't, the pay isn't great. Um, and also, a lot of the time, like, we wish that things had gone a different way and you just have to accept the outcome. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not the kind of girl that just accepts outcomes. I don't think that's going to work. So I started to flirt with the idea of something creative. I wasn't certain about fashion, but um, I, I, I'm a creative in the sense that I do like things to do with uh, branding and just creating concepts and themes and things like that so and then that's what my mom saw in me and that's what made her um take the decision quite early on to make me the creative director of her brand Diola I uh, used to be Diola CEO of brand Diola um in the old sense of the term creative director um just because her brand is 30 over 32 years um old um and at that time there was a designer and a creative director but now creative directors are seen as designers so 
Um, and sometimes people think that I am a designer for dual analysis. It's a bit complicated because it's in the old sense of the term. Um, but I am creative director for, for CLAN, which means I do the design for, for DLA, it's more of a direction, setting direction type of thing. So I've worked, um, I started working for my mom in 2012, a year after we started CLAN. The story around CLAN is, I don't know, it's a bit, so there was no like business plan, there was no, there was nothing, it was just us being bored and saying, you know, let's do something for, for some, we were, we were told we would travel. And it never happened. And we're just like, okay, fine, let's let's do something. And we decided to do a show. We literally went to the palms, scouted models, um, you called our friends, asked them if they wanted to be in the fashion show. Um, we put on a fashion show at my mom's store, and we got aunties to sponsor. And it was, and we got David to perform, which was interesting. Uh, it was literally just like it wasn't. So, it was supposed to be a one-time thing um, because at that time in school, everybody would do like crazy things like if i went to grange um and there would always be like uh, maybe during the holidays people would do like crazy projects like maybe someone would record a song and rap and then that would be the talk of you know like the whole holiday like when we get back to where we we'll would be talking about that so we just thought it would be kind of something like that just a project that we would do and it would just fade out um how and we started with Akar. it made like little shorts and bralettes um and our inspiration was actually uh very much like top shop zara things that you could easily find because I, as the other speakers have mentioned at the time there was it wasn't really that easy to find pieces that were already available everyone's best friend was their tailor so we were just like okay why don't we make some clothing that our friends would like that they would buy just for this um just during summer and then we would wrap. But then the, it was received really well. I remember Bella Nigeria carrying it, the whole thing. Uh, we called the show The Rampage. Please don't ask, I still don't understand. Um, <laughs> and, we, <laughs> and it was a hit, um, it was fun, it was exciting. Uh, we had Ekwa Dewa, like she was one of the first muses that we had, and Zena Baluga, who became a muse for the next two to three years. Um, and we saw that there was actually a gap in the market so we decided to ex explore that further um my mom was so so gracious because she invested in this crazy idea which did not have a business plan no sort of direction or anything you'll see from the first i guess two to four years that we were just going like from we did we explored and that's a clear plan because there's three of us myself and my two sisters were all so different um so there's always, everyone's always trying to bring their own expression to bear, like through the brand. And so we explored prints, um, no prints. I was very much about prints. My sister Abba was not. She did a collection that was just black and white, which has now become one of the staple, um, that's actually our aesthetic, that um, her black and white, clean, minimalist, androgynous um, aesthetic has now become uh, a pillar in our brand um, around corporate wear and my youngest sister Tiwa she's also so let me say I'm more about having a very bold aesthetic while um, my sister Tiwa is more about having she loves she did textiles in uni so she's all about developing prints and um, fabric manipulation things like that so um, yeah so clan came about in 2011 and as I said we explored different directions and in, I feel like we finally got a clear sense of what we were doing in 2018. I know that sounds crazy, but that's what happens when you're young and you launch a brand and you haven't really gone through all the steps, which is planning, um, doing like writing a business plan, thinking about your brand aesthetic, who's your target audience. All of this stuff was not done. We literally just put clothes out when we first started and called our aunties to come and buy. That was how it worked. It wasn't, there was no structure. And so what happened was in the middle, we had to go back to the drawing board and kind of reinvent ourselves. And I feel like we really got to handle things in 2018 when we launched something called the Power One campaign. Um, and there we just featured it with that. We just featured about 12 women across different industries, um, different body types. And we all got them to wear clan and tell their stories. And it was truly, truly, um, for me, that was a big 
moment for clan because it became clear what our message was we finally understood what we had been trying to express which is uh female empowerment and um that kind of comes from the fact that we were raised or have been raised mostly by a single mother um, and so we finally found out what it was we've been trying to communicate with the world which was that we saw women, we're trying to empower women, we're trying to promote the values of confidence and self-awareness and strength. These are all the things that uh, we were really trying to push forward and communicate through our clothing. And that's why uh, a lot of the time in the clothing you see triangles, which actually represent um, sacred female energy. Um, so yeah, that's clan story. We're 10, um, we turned 10 this year in August. Mm. And um, after like having sort of like, I guess, figured out what we're really about, um, our plan is just to continue to push forward this agenda for women. Um, and yeah, just continue to push the mark around what it means. Because we've also faced a lot of, um, I guess a lot of people are like, how are you African? Uh, because clan does not, like when you look at it, like there's no prints really, yeah. there's no, um, I guess it's it's not the typical African aesthetic. Um, and at some point we're like, okay, so like, what does this mean for us? Like, is this, is this a weakness? Um, and we considered that and we decided that it's not a weakness because, um, I mean, the name of the brand clan refers to, um, the fact that, you know, I think that's something that should bring Africa to mind. Um, it also refers to how we're trying to build a community within Nigeria. What our plan was, was to cater to our immediate community and then begin to move and expand beyond the frontiers of Nigeria. And as long as we remain within that sort of vision um, and continue to empower women, then, you know, we can push the, um, I guess, the limits around what it means to be an African brand. And I feel like that has been really, really um, pivotal actually in, in our growth in the last five years. Yeah. So I hope that question. Thank you so much, Tenny. Really, really interesting story about the growth of Clan. And I think it's, it's very obvious to see how the brand keeps evolving each year with each new collection and definitely the women empowerment theme is very, very dominant in every piece that you unveil. So I think basically from the introduction by all the speakers, what we've seen is passion always wins. I mean, each of their stories are so unique, but quite similar in the way that they pursue their passion and went ahead to do what it is they really wanted to do. So I'm just going to circle right back to you, Didi, because um, you spoke about, you know, being a journalist and having a successful career. And now, pivoting to fashion. I want to know what do you think are some of the things that help a fashion brand or that have helped your fashion brand become commercially successful? And any other speaker can also just um, jump in and give their own opinions too. Hi, Didi. Hi. Well, I think um, really, you know, whenever you, whenever you hear that term success, I think first of all, we have, we have to ask ourselves, every, everyone defines success in a different way. Um, you know, success to, to some, to one brand may be, you know, reaching a certain uh, turnover or, you know, revenue level. And it, it might be, it might be something else to another brand. Um, but I think that, you know, commercial success, I think the first thing for me, the first thing that I, first way I, I approach this is from the very beginning, um, I saw this as a business. I think that when we're creative people, and it's in terms of being creative, it's not just in, in fashion, in any way. I mean, you could be an artist, you could be a journalist, you could be a documentary maker, filmmaker, you know, commercial, um, creative people, we tend to be so taken by, um, you know, taking when people appreciate our craft, and of course you, you must be, you know, because you're a creative person, and sometimes we tend to forget the business side of things. So I think that um, that's the very first thing that I said I was going to do, that as, as much as I know that I'm, I'm a creative person, um, I had to see this as a business, so looking at those numbers, making sure that, um, you know, looking at my business plan, 
um, you know, making sure that, I mean, you can't plan everything, you know what I mean? So sometimes you're going to get it wrong, of course. Um, but just going into it with that view. Um, also, funding, you know, you, you have to spend money to, to make money. As I said, it, it, it really depends on the way you're seeing your business. Because I know, you know, there are different levels of fashion businesses. You know, there, there are some biz of, of fashion businesses that, you know, prefer to remain small or you're selling to your uh, community or family and friends. And, you know, you're successful in your own way. Right, so um, funding is 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 very is is key, you know, to the success. You have to spend money to make money. Um, so I think I was I was lucky in that because I'd had a, you know quite a long career, you know, I I I was able to you know you know save quite a lot and, and made a lot of sensible investments. Um, so I'm 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 able to invest in my business. I'm, I I don't have external funding, so I'm bootstrapping my business. Um, I also have, um, given that I have other talents. So as you know, I, you know I'm, I'm I'm a journalist. So I might not be working full time as a journalist, but I still do the you know the odd freelance you know gig. I still do the odd. I have a media company, so I'm able to have. Cause you have to have some kind of backing. You know, you either have. Uh, uh, you know, your own funding or you have an investor that's putting money into your business or you have other things that you're doing that are able to support your business. Um, because the important thing is is to try not to run out of money because then when you do <laughs> run out of money, <laughs> it can be Very the most true. depressing thing. Yeah. <laughs> also, uh, I'll, I'll try and be quick just so everyone can get their word in. Distribution uh, was quite key. I, I think... The way I started off the business, because I initially started off more sort of um, uh, D2C models, I was selling online um, initially. So one of the things that was very important to me was making sure that I had the ability to fulfill my orders. So logistics was important. So if I'm trying to build a global you know, business and I'm trying to ship to a customer in Kuwait, or Dubai, and I'm, I'm based in, I'm in London, or I'm even sitting in Lagos, but, you know, and the business is in London, I need to make sure that my products can get from London to Kuwait. So that was one of the things I did very early, which, um, you know, I, I'm very thankful that I did that, because now I can sit down in you know, my bed in Lagos and their parcels being shipped. So I, I set up that fulfillment process very, very early. So I had a fulfillment partner that was able to do that. So even though now I've sort of moved away from just being like an online business and it's more sort of wholesale slash more of a hybrid type um, model, um, I'm still very thankful for that and that I have that, that you know, sorted. And distribution as well. Um, so trying to try to figure out okay how at the end of the day it's, this is uh, it's selling you know so you're, you're trying to sell your products and so you you create your beautiful designs but you're trying to get those designs out there so um how do i get you know my products into the eyes of so fine i have an audience so i have people who've been reading my blog and i have people who've been following and all that you know but then how do you get that across to to other people so it's either you're selling you know uh, direct to consumer or you have hybrid model or you're doing um you know wholesale you're trying to reach buyers which is very hard you know but at the, at, at the end of the day you know um if you do get it right then it's it, it's it's you know it's it's everything even though that in itself is it's a whole topic on its own um but distribution and also look at case studies so i i was looking at examples and especially because you know i i mean like even though i have um influence of my my mom and my grandmother and i you know they can sew and they can you know they they, they know everything about fashion and i i you know, i grew up with them so obviously i learned from them but still um looking at examples of other people who have done it so you know if there's a particular brand either a nigerian brand or or an international brand and i'm like okay you know what is it that i'll give an example what is self-portrait doing that i can't do you know so how did they make it so i'm trying to you know, look at their. So, in other words, you know, some people will call it mentorship, but it's not. It's not direct mentorship because I'm. I'm trying to figure out. Okay, what what steps have they taken, um, and then um, trying to follow that, in, but in my way. You know, so that's it for me. Thanks so much, Didi. Samaya, I'd really love to get your own take on this because I know as a, when you must have started in Ghana. Ghana wasn't really that hub of fashion for the continent mm -hmm. and it must have been, you know, pretty rough yeah. to run a 
profitable fashion brand. So how were you able to tackle this in the early stages? Were you funded? Yeah, yes. You can go ahead, please. So we're, we're not funded, like 100% uh, from business. We work from scratch all the way here. So we just look into, like, we, we, Captain and I sat down, that's my partner, we sat down to think through her own, and we decided to go into every Ghanaian home. And then going into every Ghanaian home, being from death all the way to even death, because we are more into occasions. Ghanaians want to spend on occasional stuff. That's naming ceremony, uh, marriage ceremony, weddings, as in the wedding. So if you look at most of our uh, outfits, you see that more, we are more into the weddings and then the county outfits. But that's what people really want to want, patronize. But we realized that people were rather bringing, bringing in um, wedding gowns that were already bought, actually, to us, to make, to do alteration. Oh, and wow. Said, okay, yeah, to do alteration, because we just patronized from abroad. We didn't have any shop or any store that, that was stocking all this stuff. And we didn't have designers really into it. Really, really into it. And then with the Kinto also, people thought it was so, you know, as modest. It was worn, maybe on Independence Day or when they said we are instilling a chief. That's when our Kinto as a cloth were being used. It wasn't really fused into the contemporary style that we are seeing now. So we decided to tackle that. Like, we decided that, okay, so if we should make Kinto for, you know, for our brand, we should make it in such a way that we can fuse in what people want to wear with what we have now. So we realized the younger ones, yeah, the younger ones really, really we're really into it. So right now you can see them even wearing them to prom, wearing them to a, uh, how do you call it, a uh, wedding, wedding, wearing them even on their birthday. But I remember one time we made it an outfit for uh, the a uh, twenty uh, fifth year uh, birthday, and I was so shocked that this lady who was so much into this kind of outfit that were out there, really wanted to wear Kate on her birthday. So I realized that, okay, there's market in there. And they, if you do it well, and it put in, like, you mark your cup for well, people will be so much into it that will pay you for it. And that's what we're looking into. And then with the wedding gowns, like, we realized that, okay, so if someone wants to, make an, uh, wants to buy a wedding gown, which is really well made, they want, they want to travel abroad, all the money that goes to it get a good job, go to the store, you know, all money that they have to find before they could pay for the outfit. So that was something that we also look into it. So instead of you going out there, we can just tackle the money that you're going to spend on yourself, not just on the outfit. But the money that you are going to spend on yourself is what you want to work, you know, get for our brand. So that's how some way somehow we're able to and that time goes on to I try to, you know, further my education out there. So I've done some abroad. I did some in Milan and some in London where I could you know, learn some certain kind of finishes, like the cottage for instance, because I would do more of the cottage so I wanted to know what goes into it. So through that, I, this is what I was also able to fund it, go out there, learn, come back, and then fuse it into to what we have here. So when if you see most of the things that we put out, you see that most of it are all buyed out. But that's what we realized that the market, uh, the market is looking for, and that's what we're ready for. And so mm. I hope you get me. Yeah, definitely. Thanks so much, Smaya. And I love that you mentioned, you know, taking your pieces and showing outside of the continent. It really just brings me to my next question, which is, um, I think a lot of the designers here, Pistis, Lisa, Ejiro, um, and even Diola Sego, <laughs> before a clan came and um, from the continent have now been uh, sort of pioneers of the fashion brands who have gotten that international recognition and you know you have people from wherever ireland okay. wherever rocking african made pieces um exactly. i just want to know or uh, maybe lisa or, or ajiro can really shed more light on it and how have you been able to make your brand position your brand as that brand that you know is great on the continent but also people that are not on the continent have a look you know it's something you might like you know did you have to do trade shows did you have to show at fashion week how what was the process like of making your brand more internationally recognized um can i go this is me yes please <laughs> yeah i think that for us and it's still the same today actually we are very focused on the product so we are really focused on um 
our pieces, our designs, what we're putting out there and, and the brand value. So um, from day one, you know, I had the intention to create these, like I said earlier, not to repeat myself, but it was very, it, it's very much my intention every day to create um, pieces that for me transcend um, boundaries. From day one, I never ever thought even though it was it was i was here in nigeria and it was me filling a gap that i felt was missing in nigeria in fact in africa to a certain extent however my mindset was more global i'd always said you know the clothes that i love the clothes that i wear the clothes that i will make are things that whether i am making use of fabric that is local and indigenous to me, um, they will transcend boundaries. And that's, and I, I always knew that. And so perhaps it's in the designs, the styles, uh, but that was always the plan. So for us still, we continue to focus greatly on the product. So we're focusing on the pieces we're making, the designs, the styles, the concepts, the inspiration behind everything. You know, we are very strong on we're very strong and intentional with our prints with our colors with the craftsmanship um with what every collection is saying the stories behind each collection and from this we realize because you see even from i mean starting out like you know the two speakers before uh, the brand is self-funded um and so for me it's always been i knew that success was not going to happen overnight um, but for me, what it was, was how do I get this brand on everyone's mind? And I'm still in that place. And, you know, we made, we took advantage of every platform that was available to us. Luckily for us, when we started the brand, um, we had certain, um, magazines um we have the true love um genevieve is still here i don't think true love is and we had opportunities to um have our clothes and our pieces as content in these magazines um we were able to we had our first fashion show and we were able to show on many platforms which not only in nigeria but abroad um, and i think for us you know it was that there was a consistency in everything that we put out there from day one. And so people quickly got familiar with the brand and people began to, tr people trusted in the brand over a period of time. And I think that internationally, this is how we've been able to perhaps, and we're still um, in the process of, um, what's the word, of really planting our foot in, in you know, it, here and internationally as a brand because i think that that brand visibility um has we've been able to take advantage of that um and even today you know more than i mean compared to when we started out as a brand there's so much you know so many platforms to leverage on you know um i mean my goodness you don't even have to have a website today you know just Instagram and uh, YouTube or TikTok or Facebook or whatever, all these platforms are available for us to, or to brands today so that your brand can be visible, you know? And so, yeah. Um, what else? Can you can you repeat the question again? Because I think I just rambled. <laughs> no, no, no. hundred percent. I think you completely yeah, answered okay, the question. Can... The question was, yeah. um, how were you able to internationalize your brand? and get your brand out there yeah I, I i like like i said i think it was you know really taking advantage of the platforms that you know were yeah. made available to us um showing abroad and just really um you know having a consistent um brand um should i say brand value and um brand personality that people have identified with and I think that um, you know we we make I think our clothes are, I don't know if I can use the word joyful I think the clothes that we make I think everyone wherever you are in the world you know you can relate and whether it's in um, our local fabrics and care or not or it's a silk a printed silk dress or whatever um i think that wherever you are in the world they, our pieces are, are modern our pieces are very much um you know um 
what's the word, the oppressors are global in a sense. And I think that, you know, that's what's given us a good footing. Um, yeah, I yeah. think so. Uh, if I think of anything else, I will definitely mention as we go along. Thanks so much, Lisa. I think you did justice to the question. But if you were, I would really like to know if it's the same for you and if you have encountered any challenges in internationalizing your brand if there have been any challenges so far i just want to know like the flip side lisa really gave us some strong points some strong successful points that have worked for her so i want to know if there's a flip side to it um so for me i wouldn't say there has been flip sides but it's been intentional work it's not um, something that happened just because I was being awesome. But from day one, I kind of drew up a business plan even before I quit my job to start my business. And I knew the kind of brand I wanted. I knew how far I wanted to go. And so when the said she had mentors that were not real, like, you know, he just stopped people. So I stopped Matthew Williamson, I stopped Lisa, I stopped Lucy Amber, I stopped so many other people. And just learn um, another person who died on Fostenberg. So I would every day go to everyone's website back in the day and just update and see what's going on and see what my plans are, what I can tweak. And I did a lot of studying. I went to a lot of entrepreneur, uh, on a lot of entrepreneur courses. And I took advantage of the government agencies and platforms that were available. So I, I, I have, um, this brand has been bootstrapped by me all along, but then I did get the, um, um, a grant at some point, I think why I got six years ago, um, UN, the UN grant to help with businesses and stuff like that. So I've, I've always been intentional about how and where I want to place my business. So that really helps with going global. So even so starting out my first year, I made sure that I looked like how I wanted to be seen. So within the first month of starting my business, I had my branding all sorted. I had the website, I had all my social media pages, I had my business card. Back in the day, we had a very, we're very particular about having business cards and stuff like that. So and I went on exhibition, but I still do that. So I did a lot of pages locally and internationally. So I would apply for everything and anything that made sense and that would give my brand the right visibility. But I was conscious about the associations that I made. I didn't just do any show. I, I've shown around Africa in so many countries, around West Africa, almost all the fashion, um, the places where they have fashion shows. I've shown in over seven countries in West Africa. Wow. I've shown um, several countries in Malawi, Kenya, South Africa, in the southern hemisphere. I've shown in Europe, I've shown in America. So I've always I've, I've done exhibitions, not just showing now. I've done like installations. So I've always been particularly this comes with also studying art within this crime and that's like how artists basically do their art and, and role. So that was always in my subconscious that I have to see what the rest of the world is doing. You have to venture back to yourself against the other world that if you think of yourself as a world how somebody who's going to play on the world crime. So every time I did an interview and say, oh, you're Nigerian, I'm like, first of all, I'm just a designer, but I'm of Nigerian descent or I'm of Nigerian heritage. I am not a Nigerian designer. I mean, I don't design with our local fabric all the time, but then I can mix and match. I don't like to define as African because I use certain type of fabric that Kenny was saying. Like, so all those things, um, with the clear thought and intention helped the brand get to where it has gotten to. And it was very intentional. There was no, you know, I started going for shows in Ghana by Rouge, like way back 10 years ago. I always went and looked for the fashion community and just to network with the fashion people, the community, the, the, the people that will continue to close, test the pulse of the people, what they like, what are they doing, how. So, I feel like you, you go out and make your own luck, really, with your fashion brand. And luckily, these days, we have social media that can help you do that much more easily. But there's something with actually being on ground. And then, with getting stuck in, it's real work. You have to network, look for email, grow, standardize, and then 
you know, be able to work with people on that on that um, level. Even if we be in Nigeria, I did do my distribution network to over 15 stockists at some point. Wow. But when I, yeah, um, in different states, uh, and some multiple, like if we didn't make us, I had over seven stores carrying my brand. Um, Abuja, like three, Otako, two, Calabar, one, you know, and then other parts of the world as well. So I was just very particular. Like if I couldn't physically get my own store at the time when physical shopping was a main thing, I would be in the face of the customer as much as possible. So I constantly traveled and went to look for this opportunity. And that's how we've grown and been able to remain and be an international voice on fashion sales. Thanks so much, Ijiro. You touched on even some other questions that I have here. Okay, Tenny, I'll just come straight to you. I know you spoke about, you know, starting to attend Fashion Week from a young age with your mom. I really would like to know at what stage should a brand be? You know, Ijiro touched on how she used to show at Fashion Weeks and trade shows, you know, all around the world just in intentionally trying to put her brand out there but i'd like to know from you at what stage should a brand be looking into trade shows and fashion week and all of that how did you get started with clan and yeah yeah um okay um with clan we started off by producing in nigeria um we had my mom's workshop which was more than um, I mean, she was really kind to let us use that. Um, and we would use her tailors, so her tailors are foreign. Um, and they would just, we would do like designs, they would make the samples, and then we would then make everything bespoke. But that's a very costly model. Um, and you know, going back to what I said about not having a, a business model or, or a business plan, it really means that before things, you're just basically like living a dream. It's not real and the bubble will burst. So that's what happened in 2017 for us. Um, we had actually gone to New York Fashion Week um, in 2014 and showed alongside um, our mom. Um, and that was great. But then after that, there was this question of, you know, how do you get this product to um, to the consumers? Um, and we had to, we went back and we thought, okay, we can, we can just make these things and make us and then support them. Um, but as we all know, that's a very, that's very expensive given the fact that the infrastructure here is not uh, at that stage where it can support a uh, big um, sort of like manufacturing, uh, I guess, projects, not without a substantial amount of capital, which we definitely do not have. And we couldn't ask um, my mom to do that once again. Um, so we kind of we kind of had to go back and strategize on how to move forward and um, actually begin to make because think about um, to make it to make your fashion business profitable, you have to think about what your business model is. So is it are you doing like less uh, quantities for more money? Or are you doing more, more in terms of quantity for less money? Because obviously, like, when you look at it, that's a numbers game. Now, with my mom, the, the issue we had was that we were using a model that was suited to my mom, who does bespoke clothing. And thinking that we could somehow make that work for Khan. Um, and it wasn't working. For a long time, we were literally just breaking it. And it wasn't profitable. Um, and we had gone to show in 2014 in New York, and we couldn't deliver um, on, on, on the order that's on any order because there was just no way that we were going to be able in terms of margins and uh, numbers it wasn't adding up so for me what I learned from all of that is you should have a plan for your manufacturing before you even decide to go um, onto a, like a runway because the whole point of going on the runway is making it clear that whatever is going on you can deliver that to buyers in fact buyers should see your things first before you even go on the runway because the runway is more of like for me the runway is entertainment it's not something that necessarily guarantees sales you should have worked on getting orders before you go to the runway so that by the time you've done that it's just basically a chance for you to show show the world that there's a new collection show the buyers who have already ordered or who are already interested that this is how to start the collection um, and also just really connect 
with your um, just really connect with your um, just your target market. Um, and so it wasn't until we understood that that we started to make progress. So in 2017, we decided to go ahead and um, mass manufacture our clothing, um, and we did that in Europe. And we launched, we did that for the Power Man collection, which went along with the Power Man campaign. So they were both uh, released at the same time, and it really it worked so well. The fact that there was a campaign featuring all the clothes that we had just mass manufactured, um, and it was readily available to, to purchase. You know, we sold out of that collection, uh, you know, pretty quickly. So I think my advice would be, before you start doing trade shows, because there's this bias against Nigerian businesses that were not able to deliver like I've had it a lot of times like when we um, because we had we did a Paris um, through um, I think it was Lagos Fashion Week at Star House Files we did um, a, a showroom in Paris where we got to meet the, the biggest uh, buyers in just around the world like people from Harrods and um, Selfridge is different different people and for us you know, it became very clear and important. Um, Lisa Falaoyo was, was there as well, and it became very important to us. We found out that, look, if you cannot deliver an order, then don't even bother. This is a waste of time for you, both yourself and the buyers. And it leaves a lasting impression on your brand that you're not ready to export. And that's more harmful than anything in, in, in that sphere of, of business. It's harmful. And we've had to do this a couple of times now where last year we, um, Browns made an order from us through Homecoming. Um, and, and so right now we're stocked um, in Browns on their website and also on Farfetch. So before you put yourself out to be someone who can do a run with you or, um, or attend a trade show, please make sure that your manufacturing and your supply chain are sorted. And even distribution channels, like you've already, you're already in talks with people, like you can register for trade shows or you can, um, you know, pitch. Because sometimes we literally just do cold pitches to stores that we feel are aligned with um, our, our brand message or aesthetic. And sometimes they do respond. And that way you can just, you can push your product to them. Um, and so I feel like if sort out fat um, and your manufacturing as well, because some people are able to manufacture in Nigeria, that's not, that's not for plan right now. We just are not able to do that. Yeah. So if you're going to be manufacturing offshore, which is also a huge project, because you're going to have to keep traveling to check on stock that is being produced and do all the fittings and things like that. Um, just make sure that all of that is sorted before you, you list yourself as someone who is ready to, to export um, product, products. And also make sure that the quality of the product um, is, is fantastic. Um, make sure that there is the value proposition of the product is high and is appreciated by your target market before you put money behind it, because that can also be very costly when you produce the wrong things and if your target market is like yeah i'm not really this is not what i want these are all the different uh, technical steps that i've learned over the past uh i think i think since 2017 yeah um what how to make sure that all these dogs are in a row before you then search to a fashion show or or do um feature so can, I, can I jump in there? Sure, quickly? sure thing. Lisa. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, in addition to that, you know, what I've, I've, I've learned is that um, you have to be as transparent as, um, as it gets. You know, um, when dealing with international retailers, you have to um, manage their expectations, if I can say that. I think that, you know, knowing your own level of productivity and knowing what you can deliver within your lead time, you know, um, I think that is important that we, especially now where um, there really are no defined rules anymore. I think that, you know, especially with, you know, um, coming out of a, a pandemic and, um, yeah. you know, things, I mean, in the fashion world, fashion ecosystem, you know, the creative ecosystem, should I say, you know, they're really tr still trying to find a direction at the moment. So I feel like, you know, there are no rules. And so this is a time we can um, 
make our rules. Um, so we have been dealing with you know international retailers, and we have been as transparent with what we can deliver within the time that within the lead time that they have put to, to um, before us. And so if this is um, our production capacity, this is all we can do. You know, and and we found that they prefer that you are upfront with that information, and they're happy to still well in our experience they're happy to still go along as far as what you have said you can do you can do i think a lot of the times we're under pressure because of course everybody wants this um sort of global um success and um recognition yeah um but but really at the end of the day like you know tenny said you 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 know we've we've experienced that before we also um a few years into the brand the starters of the brand we had uh, an order from a very reputable international retailer and we just were not able to meet up with their demands after a little while and that was it was um, it wasn't a good look for us as a brand but then you know i thank god for mistakes like that because if not you wouldn't know what to do today right <laughs> and so transparency is so key and sort of know what you as a brand your own level of productivity and what demands you can meet very upfront with that and, and and i think that that just allows for ease of um of uh, the relationship with with the retailers you know so i just wanted to put that up there. I, I completely agree thanks so much lisa hi ag i know you um raised up your hand for a question but since we're still on the topic of uh showing at fashion week i just wanted to ask didi um i know you made your paris fashion week debut in 2020 just before the pandemic hit and then had a virtual show i'd like to know i got i think we got this question via instagram dm but i still think it's relevant to ask do you think fashion shows and fashion weeks and showing especially now post 2020 post pandemic do you think it's still important and i've noticed um for the few seeds for the few fashion shows we've fashion weeks so far this year a lot of top brands have pulled out and not shown what what do you think do you think it's still important for a brand maybe a new brand or an already established brand to participate in fashion week um i do uh, i think that um fashion week is really good for visibility uh, i think you know as as tani mentioned as well you know you especially when you're a new brand you you, you want you know, Lisa talked about it as well. You want your brand to be out there. You want you want people to know who you are. Um, in, in a normal world where we're not in a pandemic, you know, clothes are going down the runway. People can see the way the clothes move. Um, there, you know, there should be. I know it's not always the case, but there really should be. Or usually, there will be buyers in attendance. There will be press. You know, they will be able to feel. You know, take a look at your. your the way you tailor your clothes or look at the fabric or just you and especially when they're not familiar with your brand um you, you can you could say that oh online is great because it reaches more people but you know for a new brand um, and you know this has been an experience i've had you know for for a new brand yeah you, you can see it you can see pictures but i mean personally yeah, I mean, i'll tell you i i like the way my you know my my collection looks in reality i think it looks better than the pictures but the thing is, you know, the buyers and the press can't see that because it's online, right? So um, I think it's, it's, it's very important in that regard. But at the same time, like, you know, like Tenny said as well, you know, we tend to sometimes think that it's just an event. But the whole point of, of being, at, you know, at a fashion show and having a runway show is really to attract buyers, you know, or, or maybe if there's press in attendance for press to know. So it's, it's about visibility and, you know, you may not, necessarily place an order that that day but it is for buyers to know that you're in the game really um so uh yeah in, in, you know for that in itself i think that's important but at the same time um it can also be quite expensive you know it's, it's, it's an expensive it's an expensive it's an expensive step yeah. so depending on where you are in in, in the journey um, if 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 you cannot afford to 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 take that route, there you know then then there are other ways you know and I think that if there's anything that um, Nigeria or the industry in Nigeria has has shown us is that you know we we can be successful even without having to follow that mm. international model. Like of, of course we all want to follow the international model. You know I mean 
who doesn't want to be a, a you know, big brand name? You know, but at the same time, in Nigeria, we've been able to build this direct to consumer business where that that you know a lot of veterans, who many of who we have, you know, in this conversation have you know have been able to succeed, you know, significantly that way. So. Um, you know, but at the same time, they have done their runway shows as well. And that is, I guess, because of those runway shows that, you know, we even know that their brands exist. Uh, so, I, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm all for it if you can afford it. But also, you must know the reason why you're there, you know. And like as Tenny said, if you do have an, 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 an order that comes, you know, after you, you know, you attend maybe a New York Fashion Week or a London Fashion Week, and someone calls you and says, "Oh, you know, I need you to, I need to place a, an order for a hundred thousand dollars, for example." <laughs> let's just say, in an ideal world, I want to place a hundred. You, you have to have, yeah. the, you mm-hmm. know, you, you have to have the funding to produce because no one's going to give mm-hmm. you that hundred thousand dollars and say, oh, "Well, I mean, you, you don't need a hundred, but even the, you know, the cost of production, say forty thousand, you have to have that money available yeah. to produce. So you have to be ready." You know, so it's not something you just jump in and say, oh, I just want to do Fashion Week because I just want to do Fashion Week. You have to kind of be ready for every single thing. You have to be, you know, as you're there, expect that you might have a call from a buyer. Or you might see a buyer. If, if it's digital, a buyer might get in touch with you in, a, in an ideal world. doesn't always happen. Or, you know, if it's, if it's on runway, you might see someone that approaches you and says, you know, we want to place an order. Can you deliver in two months or three months or six months or whatever? You, you have to be ready. So you have to have your manufacturing ready. You have to have, um, you have, to have the funding to produce your collection. You know, so all, all of these things are things to, to consider. So while it's nice and it's glamorous to have the fashion week and to walk down a runway, you know, you also, as a business, you have to be ready for that step. Thanks so much, Gidi. Really, really amazing. Adria, do you have something you would like to add? Um, yes, actually. Okay. Um, so I know we're all speaking from a point of uh, being ready, but I want to speak organically to let's say how I grew my brand. I know what you're saying is the ideal in the standard situation, but let's look at the Nigerian situation realistically. A lot of people that are in fashion space now, up and coming fashion entrepreneurs, they don't have funding, they don't have that access, they probably don't even have the background to do all of that. But they have to build a social network, they have to build their financial network, they have to build a sort of um, face for themselves to get to this point and i believe that it's in taking little steps now this is the world stage what about the local stage you have to build gradually up and up and up before you get to that stage where not for everyone that it depends on where you are so i don't i i, I wanted to say this so that um, somebody who doesn't have all of that or doesn't think they can just make it straight up to Paris Fashion Week or even to show in Europe or feel like, oh, then it, it's going to be a long wait. Or, and you have to build, like, learn. Like, children go to nursery school, then secondary school. So you, I think it's good to even start to test yourself and then, you know, going to something like um, homecoming, that's also sort of, um, what would I call it now? Um, you're going there to, 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 to meet buyers, so to speak, or to see your community or people that could buy your stuff. So everyone will find their footing. It's perfect and fantastic for all of us to be on the world stage. And if you dream it, want it, you will get it. But I also meant to preach that um, gospel of, not, uh, of being comfortable with that in small and even doing all the work that you need to do at that point do wait till when you feel like you have it all figured out because mistakes are part of the journey all of us have made mistakes you should just not make the same ones we've made but you should be willing to to climb that ladder make your own journey make your own luck i didn't follow the play and the fashion label when i was talking about my brand i went again everything that most of the people I was studying, I was studying them to go against what they were doing because I knew I wasn't like them. I knew who I was. I knew my strength. I knew my weaknesses. I knew their strengths. And I knew what they, like, they were not working necessarily like me. So I needed to work with what I had. And then it worked for me eventually. So I'm just saying, since this is to us on this continent, that is the up and coming continent, you know, do the most you can with the little that you have. Put yourself out there and it, it would all come together. I mean, 
now took you to showing around the world. Now Max the Beam is showing. But at some point, we're all just going from trade, tiny exhibitions, tiny exhibitions, and stuff like that. So let's let's just you know be bold. You can like this is it. You need to be honest. It, there are also small boutiques that can buy your stuff. It's not only big retailers. There are also buyers for smaller boutiques. You also need independent boutiques. So it depends on your business model. There's no one way to fashion success. It depends on what fashion, what success is to you. You could be selling out of a thousand independent boutiques and you're as successful, even financially stable, as somebody said in Arthur Harold. So you just need to define what it is to you, what formula you want to use, what works for you with your model of production and vision and access, and then grow to become the world power that you want to be. That's what I would say. Thanks so much, Edra. I think that's a good um, second side to things. Samaya, do you have yeah. something to say about this? Yeah, so okay, as, sure. uh, as you said, I, I really, really, really get it. But I think you should just find what you are good at. Everybody is trying to go out there. Everybody wants to go on the international stage. But we keep forgetting that African, African market, just looking at the West African market, the West, they have the French, they have the French, you don't really understand, but they really like what you do. So you should just find your niche and then master your craft. When you master your craft, you don't even need to be anywhere. You just find the buyers coming to you. So I don't think you should just try it. Like every time you just want to be on the world stage, which is very good, but we should try as much as we can to satisfy our people. Because our market is big. Even if you should go out there, our people are going to patronize us. So I think you should, whoever is listening, should just master your craft, believe in what you are doing. And no matter what, whoever believes in your craft will come to you. And that's what I just want to add on. Thanks so much, Samaya. That's really, really insightful. Um, Iggy, we're ready for you to ask your question now. Just a reminder that this conversation is being recorded for us to repurpose across our platforms. Um, if you want to ask a question, you can just raise your hand and I'll invite you over to the stage. Hi, Iggy. You can go ahead now. Hi. Hi, hi everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, it's such a pleasure to join you guys and just to sit here and listen to you guys. I'm proud of what everybody is doing and thank you guys for having me on here. Um, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to chime in on something Tani said. I'm a manufacturer. Um, my company is anyway in New York. I'm a manufacturer for brands all over the world. We do uh, Sally La Point. We do private collections for Harrods, we do Chloe, we do Jacobs, we do um, a host of a host of companies um, across Europe and the US. And I, I do think that Tenny has a point when she says um, you know you have to line your dot. I, I think a manufacturer is a big dot to line to line up. And so I'm just gonna talk to you guys briefly about the manufacturing end, you know. I think, like Sumaya was saying, master your art, right? master your craft. Well, I think you have to invest in a, in a manufacturer, in creating a manufacturing relationship as a part of mastering your craft. Because the big, um, the big, the big bridge between your vision and and uh, and your success like having your vision out in the market the bridge is your manufacturer and for us manufacturing is always just a conversation but it's a conversation you have to invest in a conversation you have to find a dedicated person to have with all the time because if you get that right then you have you have sorted out the biggest one of the biggest parts of getting your line out because they will understand what your quality expectations are. They will understand your delivery expectations. They will understand your, you know, not just quality of work, but quality of textiles, quality of trimming. And so there's a lot that happens for a brand from just the manufacturing relationship. Yeah. I know in Africa, I know in Africa sometimes it's difficult 
for us as a manufacturer right now, we get a lot of demands to make things in Africa because today's sustainability is, um, I don't know, it's like the driving conversation in mm. fashion. So everybody wants it to be sustainable. In Africa, everything is sustainable because we have no access to the, to, you know, the things that make things unsustainable, meaning lots of chemical use in, in dyes and just um, child, like cramped labor uh, facilities and all yeah. of that. We're not that big yet, so Definitely. we don't have these challenges yet, you know? So everybody wants to make in Africa, but the problem is, we don't have the capacity. And capacity is not just numbers. Capacity is skill and numbers, you know? When, when numbers and skills meet, then you have capacity. And that's what China has. That's the advantage they have, you know? For us, our facilities are in eight countries, and they are in eight countries based on specializations. Mm. So we may do lingerie in, in Brazil. We may do some in, in, in China, depending on the quality of the, of the policy the client is looking for and their, their product uh, bracket, whether it's luxury or mid-luxury or, or value, you know? And so we, we may do shoes in Lisbon or Brazil, we may do shoes in Italy, but it's all a question of, um, of the, quali the quality of the buyer, the, the quality of the product, the quality expectations. So when you have these conversations with your manufacturer, trust me, they have, they have, capacities in different places and at different levels. Once they know where you need to be, they'll help you. Yeah. And trust me, it's not all about money though. Sometimes manufacturers can do a lot to cut money. Like, you know, Teddy was saying something about, um, about, you know, if you produce overseas, then the cost of, you know, shipping your samples back for fittings and stuff. Well, now with technology, there's a lot that can be done, you know, so, if we need to invest on a manufacturing and on a, on a model that fits you totally, we can do that together with you, you know? And then we can do all your fittings virtually. And so you get, you do get sample runs, but there's a limit as to how much money you have to spend softening samples around, you know? So what, what, all I'm saying is, yes, you guys are doing incredible at what you're doing, but I think that it, it, it will help to, you know, invest, find a manufacturer locally or overseas, invest in that relationship because trust me, they can really help you. Once you get to know your manufacturer very well, there isn't anything they won't do to assist you, whether it's sourcing fabrics and stuff. See, I tell you guys, Africa is so huge in terms of its footprint and fashion, but nobody talks about it. We are trying to make that, to, to, to bring that narrative out now with these conversations we're having, with these unions we're having, we're starting to meet each other and see where our capacities are, you know? See, Chanel, all the, the channels that I used to make those famous Chanel jackets are made in Africa. Nobody knows about it. Oh, wow. So like, <laughs> yeah, the meal, that, the meal that works, we develop yeah. uh, tweets, we develop different tweets for different people, but that same meal, develops our blankets mm. for our home, mm. home decoration mm. company. And they develop these channels for channel. And now we're just introducing them together with them in the US market for different, for different designers. Before it was mostly exclusive, wow. you know? But Africa has that imprint, mm -hmm. not just colors and prints, but we have such impact on textiles, such impact yeah. on shapes and silhouettes, you know? But we need interpretation of these things and manufacturing helps with interpretation. You guys have all these incredible designs, but when you when you match that with great manufacturing, we can be paid. Thanks so so can much, I, AG. Yes, Lisa, you can go ahead. Hi, hi AG. Just wanted to ask if you have any production hubs in Africa well, in Nigeria um, is what I'm most interested in. But in Africa, do you have production hubs? So at the moment, uh, we are working on something in Nigeria. Um, okay. It's still a good secret, so I can't really talk oh, about right. it. Okay, okay, okay. But, but in Africa, so manufacturing right now is based on quality and delivery, right? right. So for a company like us, because we are so old, we can't test, we can't take it, an old customer and test things out and they don't go right. They don't go wrong, they don't go right. 
So right now we are doing Cynthia Rowley. It's a very simple collection that we're going okay. to put in Africa, okay. but we can't because you have to pass certain certifications. Right. You have to prove that you know, you're certified in certain ways that you, you don't have child labor, but you can't just tell them, oh, I don't do child labor. You have to actually be certified. Mm. And, and so most of our, most of the things we do in Africa to match certification are done like in Egypt. Okay. And, and also we do some things in Amman, which is sort of considered Africa because the, the Middle East. And yes. We have the same, the same um, no tax, no customs duty thing to, uh, to the United States, you know? Yes. So if you make things in Africa, to be honest, bringing them to the U.S., you don't pay tax. So who says old Navy wouldn't want to make all their jeans in Africa yeah. and all of it? So we have, we have huge incentives to produce in Africa, but the hubs are not there yet. We're trying to pull them. Okay, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I just wanted to touch... Um, Go back to what Adrian was Adrian was saying about you know starting small and you know not looking at um, you know um, that sort of global growth and visibility. You know we can focus on. I mean this is for brands starting out today or smaller younger brands and you know um, which is I won't say that's so true. I think that um, you know slow and steady wins the race and it truly does. Um, but I, I also want to point out that, you know, now you have so many options available, you know, so if you're a younger brand on like, when I started out, when we start, I started out the, my brand, you know, we had to do with, make the best use of the little we had, um, try to go as far as we could with that. However, you know, there's so much access and I keep on talking about, you know, the digital platforms that are available. You know, I have always thought that fashion was some was something that was not exclusive to one part of the world. I always I've always felt in my head, you know, fashion is global. Flash fashion is like I said, transcends boundaries. Um, it's very important that we are Nigerians, we are from Africa, we have the huge market, you know, so in terms of even the success, within Nigeria alone, you can be extremely successful financially, that is. Um, but in my mind, I, I just want to speak to if there are any younger designers, you know, you have so much available to you now. I've seen brands that sprung up perhaps one year, two years ago, and they have such, I mean, the, the brand visibility and, I mean, the well, what seems like financial success um, of these brands is, is amazing. You know, what perhaps it's taken a brand such as mine 15, well, 14 or so years to, um, and even, you know, 15 years to achieve some brands that just started off, you know, a year, two years ago are, are doing, and it's quite incredible to see. So I'm just saying, take advantage of everything that is available to you. You know, the low hanging fruits, take advantage of, you know, and, and the truth is we are in Africa, we are Nigerians. We've just, you know, come out of, we're coming out of the pandemic. And of course, the Black Lives Matter movement where, you know, there's, you know, there's been more of a gaze on what's happening within the fashion um, industry, within the fashion industry in, in Africa. And I think that um, we, you know, it's, it's, you take advantage of that, you know, um, eyes, uh, you know, even though we're trying to move from the Western gaze and convert that to uh, make uh, financial sense for us, you know what I mean? But it's important that you make use of every um, platform, especially digital platforms now that are available. And we have tried it, you know, you're, on Instagram, you're connecting with the world. The world is so is a much smaller place. You know, you're 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 interacting with people in all parts of the world, and your brand interacts with people in various parts of the world. So, um, start small. Um, it's important to manage your expectations. I don't mean you shouldn't dream big, but it's important to manage your expectations. But also, really make use, be, be agile, make use of what is available now and there's so much available to get your brand out there for people to see for the interest to be garnered you know so i just thought it was important to put that out there as well
thanks so much lisa this conversation has been so insightful that i really don't want it to end and i'm so excited that everything is being recorded so i keep listening to it because there's so many gems that have been shared so far to um kind of touch on what ag spoke about it was in the list of questions that some people asked um how are we tackling sustainability um i know he said you know a lot of made in nigeria products are sustainable and you know they're local crafts local crafts people creating products but for a more established brands i want to know if you know since all of this conversation about keeping our environment you know more healthy are there have there been any changes you've made to your production process and what have they been and for dd i'd like to know um what sustainability practices your brand currently has anybody can go first <laughs> um, so, um, well let me let me I, I you know like ag said you know we've always sort of practiced a more sustainable method of um production or, or uh, watching you know, what word can I use? I think production in this regard. Um, for us, with with my brand, you know, um, we have, for, apart from the sustainability angle, we come from a very ethical standpoint. Um, I think that when you are very mindful and aware um, of the people who are working with you, um, the whole um chain of production um from you know um where you get your fabric um you know the producers of even your, your cottons if you use that and and and, and the craftsmen and you know everyone in, in the whole chain of production you're mindful of that and i think that you're carefully considering what you're making um i think that is part of this whole idea and this well not idea but this this movement and and the hopeful direction that the world is moving towards and that's just being kinder to the, the earth in whatever way we can um i think that um we've always um tried to avoid waste which is part of you know being sustainable and making use um full use of you know our um the, our materials our resources um as best as we can. Um, unfortunately, Nigeria is what it is, and in terms of power supply, our generators, we cannot help ourselves in that regard. Um, but my my production um, hubs, you know, I, I try to. I, I I don't have too many tailors and people working with me, and in a way, that sort of gives me a sense of. Um, we're doing not less, but we're 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 um, putting. We, we have a, a, a less of a carbon footprint, should I say, you know, in the world because you know our production hubs are not large and we're not um, using perhaps so many equipments at the same time. Um, yeah, and, and and for us, it's it's really um, repurposing. Um, you know, upcycling. We're trying to do as well now. You know, just so that we're making we, we make sure that we have there's less waste. Uh, but even more than that, it's just you know really looking after the people who work with us, uh, making sure that everyone is well um, well paid and well looked after, making sure that all the standards that um, we, we abide by, ethical standards, um, our staff. Be it technical staff and every member of staff is comfortable and is um, like what's the word um, fully and duly satisfied in terms of um, what they get back from being a part of the brand. Yeah, and so um, yeah, you know, you know, everyone who has made whatever it is, whether it's material, whether it's your piece, you you know them, you, are, um, you know their names. I think these things are as, as important as, you know, being kind to the world. And I think being kind to the people who are the rock and foundation of, well, for me, of uh, my brand um, is, is a huge part of that. And, and that really is, you know, for me, that's success. That, that you know, um, earlier on we talked about you know, having, you know, I think it was Didi 
that mentioned, what is your own definition of success? And part of my definition of success is, you know, making sure that the people who work with me um, uh, are really happy and uh, 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 paid and a, a big part, a huge part of the, the entire Drew by Lisa story. You know, um, making sure that these people are not only them, but their their families, their communities through the brand are, um, are made are, are happy. You know, so that those are you know our little steps. Um, with regards to power, for example, we are lucky to have one of our workshops at um, Sura um, Sura Market, um, where they now have. Um, What's it called? Um, oh my God, my brain's shutting down. Um, solar. Um, solar system, solar energy. And so I was very pleased because um, I have a workshop there and it has really um, made a difference, to be honest. And um, I guess that's also a little way of us um, being uh, kinder to the environment. And I'm happy that we are part of that. Um, but yeah. Um, Otherwise, it's everything I've said before now. Um, if I could just chip in here about sustainability, I think one step that Clan has taken is to um, do much smaller drops. Um, we don't do very large quantities, which is a bit of a headache because then you have to keep uh, you do a lot more drops in, in, in a year and there's just a lot more uh, in terms of logistics and that's a lot more to bear in mind in terms of costs but we find that we feel better just running a leaner um, sort of like just leaner machinery um, essentially just because we're not we don't have so much stock and when it comes we try and sell, sell like out as soon as possible and then do all the paperwork once again to to, to do um, even more drops so that's one way that was sustainable and another way um, that we've also tried to be increasingly sustainable is to uh, make sure that the clothes are the highest highest quality possible which means that people are wearing um, these clothes for years um, and that's something that you know I wear clan, a lot of my friends wear clan, and that is something that we always get back from our clients. I've had these pants, I've had these suits for, for three years, four years, five years. Um, the only reason I'm changing my pants is because, or I'm ordering new ones, is because, you know, as I get older, I'm kind of just broadening um, below, like down, like around my hips and things like that. It's a little bit broader around there, just due to age and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, it was like the ways in which we tried to, to be sustainable and just use the highest quality fabric, highest quality um, sort of um, techniques and things like that to make sure that people are able to um, extract the maximum value and wear it from their, um, from their clothing. And they don't need to keep buying new ones every single year. Now, obviously, like when you look at that in terms of business, because a lot of the time what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that people are buying you know every single season um so that kind of ups the like anti i guess around like your creativity and the levels of um i guess innovativeness that you're going to be sort of channeling into your brand but i think for us it's very rewarding because we know that when somebody has bought something from clan we're certain that there's not going to be um they're not going to have to buy the same product again the next um the next season or maybe even the next year and that's typically that that's how i find some of these bigger brands to be quite wasteful because a pair of trousers that were perfectly fine one one day are just after two three months or four months of me wearing them just don't same and and i think that that's a lot of for me that's where sustainability um is not being maximized um and another thing that we do is we um, do trunk shows um, and sample sales just to make sure that every single thing that we have produced is not just sitting around and going to waste uh, we actually do trunk sales and clear out often um like spring clean and just give either give them out or sell them just to make sure that everything that we have used um or things that we made but we're not so keen on decide not to produce at least we allow the general public to be able to, to buy them and we use and we repurpose and use scraps of fabric from different um different um jobs that we've done so for example 
we have this um, tunic called Cosmos, and it's just a very, it's not very, it's not form fitting at all. It's just a very um, loose um, tunic, flawed and tunic with slits on the side. And what I did was, when I found out that we had so much crepe left from different um, drops of that particular style, I just took the different uh, colors and made a patchwork one. And that was also like, that was something that people really liked. So it's just about finding ways to be mindful about decreasing waste around, you know, everything that you're doing, like whether it's um, fabric or um, as Lisa pointed out, like um, your carbon, um, I think it was footprint. Um, yes, and um, just being very mindful about the quality of clothing that you're putting out there because if it's, if it's higher quality clothing, it's going to stay with the wearer for longer and it's not going to be sort of chucked aside and then someone is trying to buy some because I've, I've seen it on Instagram now what is trending and I I had to, I felt great to this as well. I had to clean out my beauty uh, supplies because it was just getting ridiculous and I felt so bad. I felt like I wasted so much um, and I see a lot of people clean out their closet. So a lot of times, the first things to go are those, um, those, those pieces of clothing that are just not very... Uh, well made or just the fabric mm. isn't great so I think investing in that side of things as well helps us to be more sustainable there's nothing we can do about I don't know who I can't remember who mentioned this but there's not nothing we can really do I think it was Lisa once again about the um, about generators and things like that mm. but you know in these ways that we can the tiniest ways I feel like it really does go long way so yeah and, and in Africa we've always um, practiced slow fashion really um when you think about our level of productivity you think about the artisanal work that goes into most of what we do it's really it's really slower fashion and slower fashion is more sustainable you know so it, it's really part and parcel of what we've done and not even aware that we were it this was what we were doing we didn't we did not think about it in the terms of sustainability that has just been made that word has become more popular in the last couple of few years should i say so um truth be told um most brands in, in africa i would say do um practice a higher level of sustainability than most global brands so um I think that in itself is um, us just unknowingly already being kinder to, to the earth, you know? Um, yeah, I thought about that. Thanks so much, Lisa and Tenny. Didi, I'd really love to hear your own, because I know your brand um, isn't based here. Yeah, I mean, um, but to be honest, it's pretty much, you know, the same thing that um, Tenny said. I mean, we, you know, we produce in limited quantities as well. So we have small drops as well. Um, and obviously we're a small brand, you know, so we, you know, we're a slow fashion brand. Um, I, I think the other thing that, you know, that's been important also was finding a manufacturer because, you know, we manufacture abroad. So finding a manufacturer that will actually do smaller drops, which, which, you know, which can be hard to find. Um, you know, most, you know, most uh, uh, manufacturing, um, manufacturers want to do, you know, you know, large large quantities but i think we've been lucky to be able to find um to work with a low volume um, factory so that in itself that you know has, has, has helped uh and um just trying to ensure that we have you know this one real waste you know we tend to use fabric from you know one season and then you know we take it into the next season if there's any um surplus fabric um and and also even like you know the clothes that don't sell so when we have you know um uh, overstock, you know, we're either uh, donating there, so we're having, you know, sample sales. Um, we're we're going to be working with um, a rental platform for, for the spring summer collection, so probably around the end of the summer. Um, you know, so some of our, you know, uh, uh, surplus uh, stock or samples are going to be, you know, used, you know, for, you know going to sort of a rental um, uh, platform um, in the UK. So, you know, just try to trying to make make the most of it you know trying to you know take steps um as lisa said you know, I, I think um you know even before the term sustainability came up i think most most nigerian designers that i know anyway were you know pretty much sustainable because you're you know most of them uh, you know, you're producing it you know, with your hands and so there's there's different ways to be sustainable and i think everyone just has their part to play you know some people are working with um uh organic fabric uh, and I think that you know you know where where there's an opportunity to do that and also one can at the same time um, 
sometimes when you're trying to be creative, uh, you know, you just go somewhere and you see a fabric, a piece of fabric, and you may not necessarily be thinking, okay, is this deep or sustainable fabric? But at the same time, it's, it's just playing, playing your part in some way. Um, we're still very small, so uh, you know, we're not at the stage where we're sort of having thousands and thousands of sort of surplus um, clothing to sort of um, find ways to get rid of or anything like that. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Didi. Uh, Smaya or Ejiro, do you, do any of you have anything you'd like to add to this? Yeah, I, I think they've said it all. But when you look at both our traditional outfits and we wear in here, it's all hand done from the room all the way to the, maybe the machine is like 50%, the rest is all hand done, all the beat work they are doing, it's all hand made. I think we're just practicing this, all this work on Google to know that we need to actually do that. So I think they've said it all. <laughs> Thank you, Samaya. Uh, AG? Yes, I, I was just, I wanted to add something, um, especially to what Teddy had said. I, you know, I, I think sustainability is such a big word. Mm -hmm. In Africa, we've always been sustainable. Mm -hmm. Um, but now we have to kind of compete on that level, mm -hmm. right? to compete as a, on the sustainability level. And, and that narrative has been thrown up by people who were not as sustainable as us. Mm -hmm. right? but, they, but they've drawn up that narrative and we have to kind of catch up with it, you know, uh, operate along those lines. You know? But what, I'm, what I was going to say is that as big as that word sounds, though, Inside of all that bigness is a lot of comfort, meaning that you can find looks and corners that are good for you, that work for your particular brand. But whatever you've chosen to be your sustainability part, whether it is making your clothes in a way that they're easily reusable, you know, that they last long enough that other people can reuse them, or whether you're using dead stock, uh, which is fabric that was discarded and you're using it, or whether you're using organic fabrics, or whether you're using some kind of dye process that is really organic and you know, not, not hurting anybody. Whatever part you've chosen, I think it's important to make that part a, brand, a part of your brand story. Because going forward, sustainability and brands that reflect it in some way, in any little way, is going to be so important as to how brands are perceived. Mm. I completely agree, AG. It's really, really a big word right now. And, you know, brands are going to be held accountable for how sustainable their brands are. But I, I don't think, I think it's a walk in the park for African, African brands and even the whole ecosystem in terms of consumption, in terms of, you know, um, consumers buying um, this thrifted bend down select pieces. People are open to doing, um, buying used clothing i know closet sales yeah closet sales so people are very open to buying from closet sale pages on instagram so it's really really interesting to see and oh my god so far this conversation has been so fun i can't believe i'm at my last question does anybody have any questions to ask you raise your hand but if not we're kind of just going to round up the conversation with one last question for all the speakers so this last question is what is the biggest lesson you've learned so far as a businesswoman or as a fashion designer, either way? So as a fashion designer or as a businesswoman. So I'm just going to start Didi, Samaya, Lisa, Ejiro, Tenny, and then we round up the conversation. Oh, goodness. I've, I've learned that it's the hardest thing you can possibly do. I think I've done a lot of, I've done a lot of things uh, in my, in my life, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still young, but I've, I've, uh, I think maybe in my, in my, in my, in my career, because I, I've tapped into a lot of industries by being a journalist and you know speaking to different people and interviewing different people, um, and I've worked in different companies and you know the, the starting and growing a fashion business or maybe even any business is 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 it's tough. <laughs> Um, it's, 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 it's really a tough game and I think that um, the best way really to see it is well this is the way I see it and especially given that I'm a pandemic um, just to look at everything long term you know this, this is this is a business that you know I just as I told the story about how you know my grandmother um, 
my late grandmother and you know, had a tailoring outfit and then my mother started a brand and she still has a tailoring outfit and a brand uh, well it's more corporate outfitters today um and then i started a brand this is something that i want to pass on to the next generation i'm lucky to have a, a daughter a seven-year-old who's completely artistic like she sketches better than me literally wow um, <laughs> <laughs> i literally steal her ideas i, I tell her to sketch <laughs> i'm like can you sketch something please and then i come like fantastic so this is something that you know i i wanted to pass on to the next generation so there's going to be a lot of hard hardship you know in, in anything that you do you know any entrepreneurial journey um but you, you just have to persevere and you know keep going um you know, we, we have examples on this panel you know you know we've been doing this for trying to calculate how many years Lisa, I think Lisa said 2004, I was like, that's like six years or something, you know what I mean? So, the people who've been doing this and, um, you know, you, you just have to keep going. Um, I, I think um, from, from the business perspective, I also want to point out that I, I think it's, it's, it's always, you know, we always hear stories about how people generally start off and, you know, I think there's, there's a general view now that on Entrepreneurship is easy. I don't know, maybe it's social media that's teaching us that the business is easy and everyone is a business woman and all that. But I know that there are different ways of, of, of determining success and you know you, you can't really you can't really define success for anybody. Um, but I think that you know if, if there's anything that I would have I would have done differently that, that I know now, um, it is that when, when when I initially started my fashion blog, I had quite an audience. So I had I had a lot of people that were following my, my blog. This was even this was pre Instagram days, you know, so this was before, I don't know what social media platform had then, but this was before, there was definitely no Instagram, you know, um, and, and I had people who were going on the blog and reading the blog, and I think that, you know, because I then, you know, my, my, my career as a journalist took off, so I was traveling and doing all sorts of other things, I stopped blogging, you know, and so when, when, you, when you kind of stop something, you know, and you, you, you tend to lose, um, you know, the audience that you had, so you, for the first few years, I was focused on something else, and whereas I should have kept blogging, even if it was just once, once, once a week, um, uh, because that 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 audience. I mean, I'm I'm I'm, I'm thankful you know, to where I am you know, today, especially so early in the game or whatever. But um, but you know, it, it would have been great to just have you know those because I, mean, I was having thousands and thousands of people on my blog. So it would have been great to have that. So if, if there's anything, I'll continue that because. You know, to have an audience is, 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 is very important, and, and I'm not saying a social media audience is just go on a page and like you, even though that is good for brand building as well. As most of, but um, why don't we hear of people that wake up and like, oh, I want to be like Kylie Jenner, I want to be like Kim Kardashian, or whatever? These guys have, a <laughs> they, have they have a huge following, mm -hmm. so they're going to launch something, and exactly. Honored at 11 million followers, <laughs> everyone's going to know that they're starting a business and then, you know, so and, and I will tell you, it doesn't always translate to sales. So mm -hmm. the followers and the likes translate to sales, mm -hmm. it really doesn't. Um, but, but still, you know, if, if, you, if, if you have that following, and, and especially with, with, with what I was doing with the blogging, where I was, I was sending out mails, and so, like, my, my numbers of people who I had then, still more way back then than I have now. Mm. You know what I mean? So if, if I had just continued, I think that's a lesson for everyone that just persevere. Like, if, and it doesn't matter where you're starting from. You're starting small and you're thinking, okay, I'm doing this to get to, I want to launch my business, you know, you know, someday, but this is all I can do now. So just sort of keep going, even yeah. if it's taking those baby steps. Yeah. Because then you'll, you'll get to a point, you know, like, as I said, I, I, I broke mine into two and I'm, I'm happy I'm, I'm where I am. When I look at it, I look back, I'm thinking, I think I haven't stopped. <laughs> yeah, so I think that's that's that's, yeah. that's my date. Thanks so much, Didi. Smaya. Very. <laughs> okay. So for me, I think I think you should you should have a vision. You should have a dream. Not not necessarily because someone is doing it. They think you can also do it. You just believe that okay, this is what I want to do, and this is what I've set my mind. To. So if you figure it out, then from there you should enhance it. You should learn. Where can you learn it from? Right then you can go to school. You can go and learn from a fashion house. You didn't just think that, okay, after secondary school or maybe after fashion school, I want to start my own business. You make a lot of mistakes. And some of them, may make, they may even make you run away from what you really love too. So just learn from someone. And when you get there, you shouldn't just be in a rush. It takes time. Everything takes time. When you're learning from someone, they think the person is disturbing you or the person is trying to use you. Even if you are being used, look at the positive aspect of it. And then learn from it. Every single thing 
that you take from them it may be useful to you, to you in the future. So I think you should learn, enhance it, and then you should focus. Okay, if this is what I want to do, this is the kind of uh, maybe I just want to be in a uh, shirt making, I want to be in a uh, corset, corset making. Focus on it, learn from it. Who is doing it? Who has done it before? What is happening? Are people into it? Is it translating into money? Is it, or is it just something that I just want to do on this part of? So for me, this three things learn, uh, do it first, have a vision, you should learn, and then you should focus. After focusing, then I'm sure afterwards you, you can put whatever you think you are good at. You can, from there, I think I'm From there, I think I'll move on. Mm, mm. Okay. Yeah. Really strong, really powerful. Thanks, Maya. Lisa? Uh, as a designer, I think that for me, what um, I am learning every day is that I must explore all the ideas that I have, or as many. I think that earlier, early on, you know, um, I, was, I was not perhaps as confident with, with certain ideas and um, things that I, I, I knew I could do, but perhaps because of people's, other people's opinions, um, and perhaps what the market was saying to me, I um, chose not to. And so this is one thing that I'm constantly working on, uh, creatively, design-wise, is exploring every idea, um, really um, digging deep into my inspiration and pushing as far as, as I can um, without any outside noise. So, um, I'm on this journey as well, where it's everything that comes to my mind, everything that I think is possible to be done, you know, um, at that point in time for that collection, I try to explore it. And if, if at the end of the day, it doesn't work out, oh, well, I'm good one that I did. Not that I didn't, and I regret the fact that I didn't. Um, another thing, I realize passion is wonderful, and I think that's what, for creatives, that's what gets you fired up and... Um, sometimes will keep you going, but it's the discipline and the consistency that um, you really truly keeps you going when you feel like this is not what I'm meant to do, or when you feel like I can't do this anymore because it's really tough and it's really lonely um, when you are a creative um, and uh, an entrepreneur. So that discipline, the consistency and like, you know, the lady, that is, um, speaker just said before the focus as well very key and the last thing is the uh, teamwork makes the dream work i've learned that i am not able to do everything i am not meant to do everything and so i am grateful that i'm surrounded by people who are able to fill those gaps and um make up for those things i'm not capable of doing and it makes life much easier and it just um you know, it, we, we're working purposefully towards the brand's vision and goal together. So, um, where don't try to do everything, don't try to be everything. Surround yourself with people who can fill those gaps, and it's not even filling gaps. People who come with their own strengths, and um, perhaps and for me, for example, I mean, I've been designing for years, and I'm so happy to have a design assistant, and I will have even more because I cannot have all the ideas. I don't even think I need to have all the ideas. I like to see things from other perspectives. Some of my ideas might even be outdated. That's a fact. And I have to accept things like that. And so seeing things through a different lens, um, different perspectives, um, seeing the world through a different perspective is, is so key, so important. Um, yeah. And for me, I'm, I too, as an giving this out as advice, I too am taking this advice and I'm constantly on this journey as well. Thanks so much, Lisa. I think those were fashion designer and businesswoman <laughs> advice. Thank you. Ijiro. Yeah, so, I mean, the speakers before we have touched with the bits of what the designer life would be like and the things that you will experience. So we did it, she said, right away the and make sure that uh, when you're reaching that, when you're gathering the momentum, you don't lose it. That's one very big, um, important lesson. Like, max out your opportunities. Do not um, just 
you need to do certain things that they come your way because the opportunities will keep coming, but it might not be on the same trajectory that will necessarily take you fast enough to where you want to go. So max out your opportunities. And some things, Maya said, there's a place for tutelage and learning. Like, you never stop learning. You must hunger for knowledge to be able to become whatever, what, what even in whatever dreams you think you have, stay hungry. That's the only way to keep breaking boundaries and feelings that may have existed in your mind or in your office. And also, it's in touch of the point of people. And that's something that, you know, being a creative, you can sometimes be sucked into your own little world and not be very aware of blessings of people around you with the work and with your network. So it's something that I've learned along my journey to be more thoughtful about my relationships across board and not privileged relationships because you are nothing without your community or your relationships that those are things that uh, hold a real value for you for the work that you do and the, the things that come up with who you work with and the people you serve. And if you're able to find your he serves humanity in your work and see that transcend, then that's everything for me. And so I'm more mindful now, and it's something I wish I knew. I, I probably knew, but it wasn't uh, strong enough in my mind to be particular about nurturing, growing, and you know, just maintaining certain relationships. So relationships, learning, and um, Ride it away. You, you better take advantage of it when you have the wave. But like Instagram is there. Like yesterday, social three social media shut down for five minutes. Mm -hmm. so you, you 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 wouldn't just think things are forever. You know, some people went start when it was Facebook, then it became Twitter, then some Instagram, and then tomorrow it's something other, some other TikTok style. So you need to, like I mentioned, did he said, have lucky days you screen. I mean. So you need to ride the wave and take advantage and build on all the blessings that come your way so that those are the stepping stones and the bedrock of your future successes. And that's something I hope that every young, young girl or newer designer or business person would um, take to heart. And even for myself, because my journey is still pretty much very young. Uh, it, it has a, a lifetime mm -hmm. and, uh, I'll be able to do. Yes, that's it. Thanks so much, Ijira. I love all the points you shared. Tenny? Hi. So for me, I feel like everyone, all the other speakers have really covered a lot of things that um, I think are truly essential. Um, these are lessons that I think are very valuable. Um, for me, I think I've learned four things. And they are around um, unique selling point, product, perspective, and heritage. Um, so the first one, which is unique selling point, is I feel like right now, uh, because of everything that's happened, I feel like the consumer is so much more sensitive um, than um, they were before, and that's just because of everything that has happened, has happened with COVID, and just having to social distance and things like that. I think now more than ever. You need to be communicating a very clear message and rooting your brand to values that you actually believe in to establish an emotional connection. Um, and you can just do that by making sure that whatever it is that you believe in or whatever it is that you're passionate about, that that is actually coming through in, um, in, your, in the way that you're communicating with your target audience. And truly, like, it actually does go a long way. Like, these days, people actually just want that extra bit of motivation or encouragement or even just a pat on the back um, for just being able to be okay in this kind of environment, um, the new normal. Um, and also with the, with pro the second one is product. I feel like once you have identified your unique selling point, um, it is essential to work that into the product to create um, a high level uh, product. So that would be your value proposition. And um, that is something that people would always appreciate because the value of the product goes beyond the physical uh, a piece of clothing it actually speaks to the values behind the brand um, and, and several other things that I won't really go into, but there are different these different facets come together um, to to create a value position and are very much appreciated um, 
by your um, consumers and it also keeps you top of mind with them as well um, and the next one is perspective because I feel like right now because of everything that's been happening with um, COVID and um, just finances and things just not being safe, I feel sometimes you know, I think one of the mistakes I've made in the past is to think that oh everything the fashion everything so fabulous everything will always be fantastic great I have faith everything anything can anything is possible uh, but there will be low times and that's something that is um, at that point you have every chance to see it as an opportunity to grow because there will be a next season so just because this season is a bit tough or because it doesn't look like things are lining up or what your, all your plans are not because with fashion things don't always like the drop that you thought was coming or that you were so sure was going to drop like it, it might not come and you just have to understand that this is not a forever thing, it's just for this season. And just know that, okay, yes, maybe there's some lessons to learn, maybe you have to go back to the drawing board to come back stronger. But there will be another season. And final one is um, heritage. And it's just basically pointing to the fact that we're all different people. We all have different backgrounds, different stories. And um, there might be that, um, I guess maybe tendency to look at what other people are doing and ask yourself why is it not like this for me too. But I think that there is it's beautiful that none of us have the same stories and truly just to have that staying power um, and to continue to build. I think that's something that is truly remarkable and it just shows so much strength. And in the end, like that will become your heritage. That is your strongest. That is your biggest power. The fact that your story is unique to you. So those are the four um, things that as I, I, I've learned and I'm still learning even now. And so it's just, once again, establishing your unique selling points, which will create an emotional connection with your brand. Um, that will flow into the next one, which is product, um, and which will create the value proposition. Um, and then perspective, which just makes you understand that there will be hard times, but you just need to stay positive and understand that this season will not last forever. There will always be another um, another season and there will always be a light at the end of the tunnel. And the final one is heritage, just having that staying power regardless of what happens, knowing that every single step that you're taking is essential to your journey and that in the end, someone is going to read about you and be inspired and don't give up because it would be selfish to because there's someone else who's going to read your story and be like, wow, because she didn't give up or he didn't give up. I'm not going to give up. So, yeah, I hope that's helpful. That's great. Thank you so much, Tenny. Thank you all so, so much. Um, we just have two people with questions. Please, we just would like to have these questions asked and answered in five minutes. So um, people who are asking the questions, please just ask the questions directly. And if you have any speaker in particular, you'd like to direct the questions, we just direct to them. We'll go with Uzoma and then Oluchi. Thank you for uh, bringing me up. How's everybody doing today? Great. Welcome. 